Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's Women with Heart online session. My name is Dr. Lisa Cody, and I am one of the organizers of the Women with Heart online series. We do have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We do have a few ground rules. First, these sessions are for education only. Please connect with your healthcare provider for specific advice about your situation. We will answer questions generally, not personally, and we may not get to all questions today, but we will do our best to answer them soon and to post them online. We encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. We ask in order for you to do this, that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please avoid using the chat function and stick with the Q&A. You can ask questions throughout the presentation and Maria will get to them at the end during the question and answer period. It is with great pleasure that I introduce today's speaker. Maria Recupero is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator who has a private practice in downtown Toronto. Maria's picture may be familiar to some of you as she was previously part of our team here in cardiac rehab at Rumsey. So please welcome Maria Recupero. So good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be here to talk about a topic, health at every size, that is very near and dear to my heart. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, yes, and let's begin. So by the end of this session, you will be able to identify why diets don't work and how they can potentially lead to harm. I'll introduce you to Health at Every Size and highlight the principles of K's. And then finally, discuss how health can be achieved even if weight loss doesn't happen. But before we get into it, um, allow me to introduce you to Pauline. Pauline was a 50-year-old woman of Jamaican background who was a participant in the cardiac rehab program a few years ago where I worked with her. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and hypertension or high blood pressure, as well as sleep apnea, which many of you may know is a chronic sleep disorder. She was taking medication for her diabetes along with two other medications uh, to treat her high blood pressure. And as you can see from the photo, Pauline is living in a larger body. She weighed 232 pounds at the start of the program, and her weight would be classified as being in obesity stage three, just to provide you with some context there. Now, since joining the exercise program at Toronto Rehab, she had worked herself up to walking two and a half miles in 50 minutes, five times a week. She was very committed to the program. And prior to the program, Pauline had shared with me how she had never exercised before, stating that, you know, she always felt tired because she worked full time cleaning um, offices for a living, and she just found it difficult to fit into her schedule. Pauline's goals were to reduce her blood pressure medications, and like many, and like many, she too wanted to lose weight. Many times Pauline was told by her doctor and other healthcare providers to lose weight. And many times Pauline went on several diets only to regain the weight back every time. And I'm sure many of us can relate to Pauline's story, or at least we know someone who's had a similar experience when it comes to dieting and losing weight. Well, Pauline had had enough and she was tired of dieting. She didn't want to have to go through the experience of feeling constantly hungry, uncomfortable, and deprived to achieve a better health. There had to be a better way. Society idealizes the thin body. <clears throat> and diet culture in general tries to make us believe that losing weight will make us happier, more attractive, and therefore more accepted. It's no surprise that in North America, the weight loss industry is a $66 billion annual enterprise. When it comes to weight loss, people are encouraged to eat less, exercise more. And often people will, well, sometimes they'll go to extremes with one or both of these approaches to achieve the desired goal of weight loss. Anyone who's been on the diet or tried to lose weight, we know that it's difficult. <clears throat> Pardon me and keeping the weight off is even more challenging. 
Weight loss is complex. And to simply state that weight loss is completely related to what we eat and how active we are is inaccurate because there's a lot more to this story that needs to be told. Here's the truth about dieting. Studies show that 80% of those who lose weight will regain it within one to two years. Almost all weight that is lost will be regained within five years. 60% of people who lose will regain more weight than they lost. And this is on any calorie restricted diet plan that one follows, whether it be Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, or any others. Dieting also promotes weight cycling. And what exactly is weight cycling? Well, weight cycling is that yo-yo effect where people will lose weight, regain it, and because they've regained, then they go back on a diet or they attempt to lose weight. And so there's this vicious cycle where weight rises and falls. And every time there is weight regain, that promotes further uh, food restriction. And as I've already mentioned, studies show how when people, people actually end up getting fatter, the more they attempt weight loss and diet. Dieting promotes diet mentality. And to explain what I mean by this, I'll give you a few examples. It's when you hear people mention how, oh, I've cheated on my diet, or I was bad, or they start to label food as good or bad, and they believe that it's an all or nothing approach when it comes to healthy eating, instead of aiming for a balance. People have a lot of guilt and shame when it comes to food, and I've certainly seen this in my practice, and I continue to see this in my practice. And this can lead people to have a very strained relationship with food, which can impact both their physical and their mental health. Oftentimes, we see people who develop um, disordered eating or maladaptive eating patterns, and oftentimes, sometimes, even eating disorders. This is when someone may seek the support of a dietitian. And research also shows how weight cycling can potentially increase one's risk of getting type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So why is it so hard to keep that weight off? Well, because in short, there are hormones in our bodies that are involved in regulating body weight. When we lose weight, certain hormones get activated that work, that actually work to increase our appetite in order to get us to eat because the body defends itself against weight loss. Yes, you heard that right. It seems unfair, but that is the reality. So the reason for weight regain is not because people lack willpower or motivation, <clears throat> but rather it's because there are some very real and well-documented research that indicates how these hormonal adaptations make it very difficult to sustain weight loss. Tracy Mann is a researcher from Minnesota who spent her entire career studying the effects of dieting and body weight. And she is quoted as saying, dieters are not to blame for weight regain, but dieting is. <clears throat> Pauline never failed at dieting. The diets she followed failed her. And at her three month cardiopulmonary assessment, Pauline mentioned how the results of her stress test showed that she, her fitness level had increased by 20%. This was really great news. She also reported that she was sleeping better, that her blood pressure was consistently lower every time she had it checked. She had made changes to her diet and was sticking with it. And she also stated how her legs weren't rubbing against each other as much, before, as, much as before. I think we would all consider Pauline a success story. I certainly did. Most people would think Pauline would have lost 10, 15 pounds easily from the description I've just provided, maybe even more, but she didn't. She lost a total of two pounds. Pauline told me how very disappointed she was with herself for not losing more weight, especially because she felt she was doing everything right. She really started to get down on herself thinking that all her efforts at making lifestyle changes to be healthier were all for nothing. And that was because she didn't see it show up in the, in the scale weight. And this is exactly why focusing on weight and using weight loss as a measure of success is problematic. Sometimes when people make lifestyle changes, they lose weight. Sometimes they lose a little and others none at all. 
Pauline experienced many health benefits. It just didn't show up on the scale. Pauline's story is exactly why health at every size exists. So what is health at every size? <clears throat> health at every size is an approach that supports people in adopting health behavior changes for the purpose of gaining health and well-being and not for the purpose of controlling weight. I want to be clear that Hayes is not against weight loss when it happens, but it is against focusing on weight or weight loss as a goal. Weight isn't a behavior. That number on the scale isn't a behavior that can be changed. Health goals really need to be behavior-based because it's what's within our control. And finally, Hayes advocates for changing the culture around weight and bodies and how we view people's bodies instead of trying to change people's bodies because we know that weight bias exists. And in essence, sometimes people are confused by health at every size that's interpreted differently sometimes, but essentially what is being promoted here is health for every size. Everyone deserves that regardless of shape or size. The Hayes principles include the following. It encourages bringing pleasure back to food and eating. Oftentimes when I meet with people, there's um, descriptions and, and conversations about this love-hate relationship that many people have with food. Hayes promotes intuitive eating, which is the, the notion of paying attention and responding to hunger and fullness cues. It's about enjoying being physically active and participating in joyful movement that, um, that people actually can enjoy and not for the purpose of controlling weight. And finally, and probably most important, Hayes promotes self-acceptance and respecting the fact that people come in different shapes and sizes. We know that a relationship between weight and health exists, but this doesn't mean that you're unhealthy if you are in a higher weight body. And the same is true for people living in smaller bodies. It doesn't necessarily mean that one is healthy because their weight is deemed or considered normal weight. When we look to the science, we know that people in higher weight bodies can achieve health when they engage in health behaviors, even if they don't lose weight. And I hope that many of you listening today can find this, you know, find this talk or this, this information reassuring. This brings us to the last objective where I'll share some key studies with you that support what I'm saying. First, some background. Studies show that people who follow a Mediterranean diet pattern have a lower risk of developing heart disease and diabetes. And I know you've probably heard um, your dietitians, Fatim and Veronica, talk a lot about the Mediterranean diet pattern. There is very solid evidence that supports it. For people living with heart disease, a Mediterranean diet can lower your risk of getting another heart attack or stroke and can also delay the progression of disease. This is well documented. What you might find interesting is that participants in these trials experience these health benefits without losing weight. And if you're familiar with the New Canada's Food Guide, the principles of the New Canada's Food Guide are very similar to those of a Mediterranean diet pattern. And that is, in general, to promote um, and encourage the consumption of plant-based foods. This might be a busy slide to some. I'm going to explain what is being displayed here, but a Hallmark study um, was the PREDIMED trial. This was a primary prevention study that was done in Spain, and it was designed to compare three different diets and the effect that it had on preventing heart attack, stroke, or even death by cardiovascular causes in patients who were considered high risk. So that was people either living with type 2 diabetes or had three risk at least three risk factors for heart disease. So hypertension, um, if they were smokers, high cholesterol, strong family history. Nearly 60% of the participants in the study were women. So I think this information is very, very relevant to our audience today. And the average age was 67 years. The results showed 
how those who followed a Mediterranean diet that was supplemented with either extra virgin olive oil or nuts had a 30% lower risk of dying or getting a stroke or heart attack. So that is quite compelling. And if you take a look at the curves here, the higher the curves go, the greater the, um, the risk associated with that. So the more events that occurred. So you can see here in the low fat diet group, there were more people who experienced heart attack, stroke or death by cardiovascular causes compared to um, the two types of Mediterranean diets. And, and essentially there was no difference between whether you had more olive oil or more nuts. Again, I want to highlight how these benefits were experienced independent of weight loss. And, um, and the other interesting fact is that there were no calorie restrictions that were imposed in these groups who were following the Mediterranean diet. So they weren't tracking calories, they weren't told to limit their intake. And interestingly, when you take a look at the average calorie intake of these participants, um, they, were at, they were taking in anywhere between 1,400 to 1,500 calories per day. The other hallmark study that you may be familiar with is the Leon Diet Heart Study. Again, another Mediterranean diet trial. This one, though, was in secondary prevention. Again, a Mediterranean diet pattern was compared with a low, fat, uh, a low fat diet. Participants in this study were folks who had already experienced a heart attack or they were living with cardiovascular disease. And what they found was that the Mediterranean diet group, and that's what this red bar here, this red tri or sorry, <laughs> rectangle is trying to illustrate, and I'm going to translate what, this, what the slide is trying to state here. What they found was that in the Mediterranean diet group, that there was a 72% lower risk of getting a repeat heart attack or dying from heart-related causes. This is huge. These, these results are so compelling. And again, this was strictly attributable to diet. Again, this benefit was experienced independent of weight loss. So in other words, participants who were in this trial, their weight was considered overweight at the beginning of the trial, and they remained overweight at the end of the four-year trial. So their weight was stable throughout. And when we look at all the Mediterranean diet studies that are available, we know that there is anywhere from a 50 to 70% lower risk of getting a repeat event um, when a Mediterranean diet pattern is followed. Pretty compelling results. Turning now to the exercise and fitness literature, there is a systematic review of 14 studies that were looked at. Um, and in particular, they looked at the effect of exercise on A1C. And A1C, you may be familiar, is a marker of blood glucose control. It's the average blood sugar control over the last three months. And they also looked at body mass, body weight in particular in these adults living with type 2 diabetes to see what impact exercise had on these two parameters. Again, 50% of the participants in this trial were women. And compared to non-exercisers, those who participated in a program very similar to cardiac rehab saw significant reductions in A1C, but no significant changes in body weight. It doesn't mean that the participants didn't gain muscle mass or that they didn't lose fat. The study just didn't look um, at these parameters. They just looked at weight in general. And the authors are quoted as saying that exercise does not need to reduce body weight to have a beneficial impact on glycemic control. And if we look back to the Mediterranean diet trials that I just shared with you, we can add to this statement and say exercise and diet patterns do not need to reduce weight in order to have beneficial impacts, not only on glycemic control, but on all other cardiovascular um, parameters like cholesterol and what have you. So back to Pauline. What I just shared with you, I was able to share with Pauline to reassure her that in fact, all her efforts were not a waste of time. Hearing this, Pauline felt relieved, but more importantly, for the first time, Pauline reported feeling free of dieting and diet culture. She started to 
feel really good about herself and was able to recognize what she had accomplished and what she was continuing to accomplish. More importantly, she felt confident that she could continue with these lifestyle changes even after the program ended. So in summary, the key messages that I want to leave with you are that health at every size is an approach that promotes a focus on health behaviors and not weight. Because we know that there are risks associated with dieting that include both physiological and psychological factors. And we know that health can be achieved even if people don't lose weight. In the wise words of the late Joanne Aikida, who was a registered dietitian from California, she defined healthy weight as the weights that you achieve when you have a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. So we'll now go into questions and answers. So um, just a reminder, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A function on your screen. I see we already have a few, so that's great. So please feel free to type in your questions and uh, Maria will address them now. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you for um, having these questions available. Uh, so thanks to the audience. Okay, some great questions coming through. The first one, if you are quote unquote, and thank you for putting that in quotes, overweight, <laughs> how do you know that you're healthy? Great question. And so again, you know, I think when it comes to um, assessing whether someone is healthy, like healthy is a broad it's a broad term and people define health very differently, right? And I really like the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is not just based on physical attributes or factors. It includes both a mental, emotional states as well. So it really is health for me and I think for most healthcare providers and hopefully maybe for many of you in the audience, it, it really does need to be holistic. And so Back to the question, if you're overweight, how do you know that you're healthy? Well, you have to take a look at everything else that is going on in a person's life. So, you know, are you physically active? What kind of food choices that you make? And, and again, the food choices don't have to be perfect or 100% all of the time. To me, I almost feel that sometimes that's not healthy because how you view food and how you approach food and eating, um, there's a lot of psychology there that may not always be healthy. And you know, how do you manage stress? How, how's your mental health? So you can be classified as being overweight, but have all these other great things in place that actually would determine you to be healthy. Maybe your cholesterol is normal, blood sugars are, are you know, within a normal range. So there are many factors and parameters that I personally as a registered dietitian <clears throat> look at. Um, to, to consider, you know, where someone falls on the health spectrum. All right, next question. So I hope that answers the question. Next question, what are your recommendations for a keto diet? Well, keto diet is a very restrictive diet. It's very, very high in fat. And, um, you know, there's different definitions of keto, but the true definition is one that is very, very high in fat. Um, virtually void of carbohydrates, and then um, the balance would be made, made up with protein. A lot of times people who go on a keto diet, in most cases, are for weight loss. So as I've just shared with you in, in the presentation, you know, um, there's a lot of risks, I think, when we focus too much and heavily on weight. Someone can lose a lot of weight, perhaps following a keto diet. But what we know is that it's short term, and that's with any diet pattern, as I had mentioned earlier, <clears throat> any diet pattern that is followed, weight loss may be achieved in the short term, but long term, so two to five years from that point of weight loss, the weight is um, generally comes back, and there's more harm associated with that yo-yo effect of the rise and fall. So I do believe in a Mediterranean diet. There's strong evidence to support it. We have long-term data on the Mediterranean diet. This is a nice segue into the next question. Would you recommend the Mediterranean diet to someone with cholesterol? And I would assume that that's someone with high cholesterol. 100%. Absolutely. 
And what we also know, this kind of goes back to the previous question, what we also know about the Mediterranean diet, which we can't say for any other diet pattern, is that it seems to be the one dietary pattern that is the most sustainable long term, which means most people can generally stick to it long term as opposed to a keto diet um, or, you know, low carb diets or any other kind of highly restrictive diet patterns. It's really hard for people to um, adhere to them long term. And it really does tend to get in the way of social gatherings and, and events. Um, any others? I think I just have to scroll down. Oh, thank you for the feedback. Someone found it informative, helpful. As much as calories shouldn't be counted with the Mediterranean diet, how do we know how much to eat daily without overeating? Great question. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I think that um, the, the dietitians in the program, Fatima and Veronica, they will be, I think, talking about mindful eating and intuitive eating coming up. And um, I hope I'm right about that. I apologize if I'm not. But I think that intuitive eating, I, I only really just, I just introduced you to the notion of intuitive eating because it's um, just in the interest of time. But intuitive eating really is about responding to hunger and satiety cues, just being more aware of what's happening in your body. It doesn't mean that we don't or shouldn't eat when we don't feel hungry but it's just being more mindful and aware of what is happening. So I think you can probably expect more on that later. And you know, I just, I wanna qualify this as different things work for different people. And so sometimes tracking does help people to, and, and I can support that if it's in the context of just raising awareness to, in, in, in helping to be more mindful about the choices that one makes. So around mindful eating, but not necessarily tracking as a means for weight control or restriction, because then we're right back to diet mentality. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I may be, I'm just scrolling down. I'm trying to get to as many as I can. Um, so here's an interesting question. If you want to lose weight from a personal point of view, can you do so on a Mediterranean diet? So again, I like to promote health as opposed to focusing on weight as an end goal because of all the reasons that um, were discussed earlier. But the reality is we live in a society that um, just doesn't accept different body shapes and sizes. And I hope one day I can say the opposite. And I do feel things are changing. So what I do want to highlight here is that you know, the results are mixed. People who have followed a Mediterranean diet pattern, some people were um, able to experience some weight loss, but a good many others didn't. And so my answer to this question is people can, it, it all depends on where you're starting from. And so, as I mentioned, you know, sometimes when people make lifestyle changes, they do experience some weight loss, but others don't. So it all depends. One thing is for sure, I do not support restrictive eating where people are depriving themselves of nourishing their body, where people deprive themselves of essential nutrients that they need for health and well-being. So if anyone is restricting their food intake that much for the purpose of weight loss, I would be very concerned with that. So it's all a balance. Um, I'm just aware of the time. I, can I continue to answer some of these questions, Lisa? Yeah, we can go with maybe two or three more. Two more, maybe. Okay, perfect. Um, let me just see here. Please specify the kinds of foods in a Mediterranean diet and approximately how much of each daily. Okay, so generally speaking, when we talk about a Mediterranean diet pattern, in general, that is a focus on more plant-based foods. It's not a vegetarian pattern of eating, but it does promote the inclusion of more fruits and vegetables, whole grain cereals. Um, so it's high, high in fiber. It's a diet that's high in fiber. It promotes, again, more fish, because we know the, the omega-3 fats that are in fish to be very um, protective in heart disease. <clears throat> it also 
um, promotes, uh, part of that whole plant-based eating promotes an inclusion of legumes, so lentils, kidney beans, chickpeas, the fat whole family, the legumes, as well as the inclusion of nuts, again, in moderation. Um, so dairy products and red meat and poultry are also included in this diet, but they're not the emphasis. So many of you may be familiar with the plate model. And so the plate model, you know, ideally in a perfect world, if half that plate is uh, comprised of vegetables and then the other half is divided between a protein source, whether that be piece of meat the size of the palm of your hand or beans <clears throat> or tofu the other quarter with some kind of um, whole grain that's that would be considered balanced eating and very much in line with the Mediterranean diet pattern um, sorry I'm just I know I'm forgetting there's another part of that question that I think I missed so that those are basically the principles of it oh I'm trying to find it I apologize I just oh, missed it. I'm sorry. So Let me yes, just find portions. it Yeah, I, I remember the, it was around portions. And so I, I think just to, to be able to speak generally, because, you know, this is where working with a dietitian can be very beneficial because it can be tailored. The, the recommendations can be tailored to the individual. But more generally speaking, I think the plate model can, can serve as a useful guide. So I hope that helps. How does this approach fit with focusing on the body mass index and waist size as a measure of health. Oh, thank you so much for, and for asking this question. You know, when we take a look, I think it does fit. I think what doesn't fit is the BMI and, you know, the waist circumference. That is, um, that's debatable. There is science that tells us, yet yes, the larger the, the waist circumference, the greater the health risk. And the same with weights, you know, and, and I'm not denying that that association exists. And I think I had mentioned that in the presentation. So we do know that this relationship exists, that the higher your weight, yes, that is associated with greater health risks. But it's by association. It doesn't mean that being at a higher weight or having a wider waist is causing health problems. And I think those terms, they're extremely different. I think those terms are used interchangeably and they shouldn't be. So be careful what you read in the media and maybe even what some health care providers, um, the way they might talk. So I want to clarify and I'll just recap. I'm not denying that there is a relationship that exists between weight and health. But this is where I think it's extremely important to look at each person on a case-by-case -case basis. So, and even then, just because someone is at higher weight doesn't mean that they need to lose weight in order to be healthy. And I think that's the point I've been trying to make because we know the challenges with losing weight. And, and again, these are physiological right? It's not because somebody lacks willpower that they're not able to lose weight or keep it off. There are some real forces working against us to, to get to stay at that lower weight. However, at the same time, it doesn't mean that people can't see improvements in their blood sugar or, again, lower their cholesterol or, again, you know, experience all kinds of other benefits. So losing weight, it's been made to sound like one needs to lose weight in order to be healthy. And I want to, I, I hope that this talk has helped to dispel that statement because there is a lot of research that actually shows us that that's not true, that we can achieve health um, just by our behaviors and making changes to our behaviors. Okay. Um, I also would just like to refer um, everyone to the Eating Healthy booklet that can be found on, um, at www.cardiaccollege.ca. So on our Cardiac College website, you can find the Eating Healthy booklet, which also refers to a lot of this information as well. So you can keep going, Maria, if there's a couple more you excellent. want. Excellent. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for that, Lisa. Does the Mediterranean diet help bring A1C down? Yes, it was very exciting research. Um, the, the trial that or the systematic review that I shared with you in the presentation was, um, again, you know, 50% of those participants were women. And it was um, these participants were in a exercise program that was very similar to cardiac rehab. 
and, um, and A1C was able to reduce. When you look at a Mediterranean diet pattern, or again, you know, we call it Mediterranean diet pattern, but you, you can refer to Canada's food guide, plant, more plant-based eating without having to be vegetarian. So that's maybe how I should word this. Okay, so when, generally speaking, 80% of the time people are making healthier food choices and are engaged in regular physical activity, we can see changes um, in A1C. A1C can drop by one to 2%. That is massive. And the impact that has on reducing complications related to diabetes is, is huge. So I get really excited when I can share these results with people because you know your medication definitely is important to take and it's playing a role. But when lifestyle factors are you know present and are make up a solid foundation of where you're at it could mean just delaying increasing medication dosage um or, ch or changes along the way so I, I hope people find that really encouraging okay i know i've skipped some but i think lisa had mentioned these questions whatever i wasn't able to answer here today i certainly will follow up with the team and um, they will be posted elsewhere. Um, let me just see if I can get one. Is it okay, Lisa, one more? Yeah, or? yeah, as many as you want. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, just give me a minute to read here to myself. So like Maria said, um, any questions that we aren't able to get to today, we will post online on the Women With Heart online webpage where you found the link to um, join us today. You'll, you'll see in the next few days um, a document there that you can see the answers to the questions we weren't able to get to today. Oh, there's so many great questions. Um, okay, here's a, here's a simple one I think I can answer. So are you saying dairy foods aren't important? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> so thank you for, Claire, for you know, asking the question. Um, the Mediterranean diet does include dairy foods, just it's not the main focus. There is another dietary pattern, the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stopping hypertension where lower fat dairy products were included and it was encouraged to include two servings a day. So a serving being three quarters of a cup of plain yogurt or a cup of milk. And I'm referring to dairy, but th that could also include alternative sources of dairy like soy beverage. Um, almond milk isn't a, a great substitute for soy or dairy just because it lacks protein. But I do want to open this up to say, again, there, as long as people are getting their calcium from, from other sources. So I, I, again, you know, I don't want to label any food as good or bad. It's just from the evidence that we have, when people tend to include higher fiber and more plant-based foods, people tend to do better. Um, Possibly for a nutritionist, there is so much scam information and questions regarding fish from China being not good for you, and I'll open that up to say maybe from elsewhere. Where does a person find decent information regarding finding good fish to eat, and how do you prepare it? Yeah, great points. There is a lot of misinformation out there, and we're hearing a lot about our food and contamination and sourcing, it is problematic. And so I will agree with you. So all I can tell you, and you know, I'm a consumer as well, so I find myself in the same situation. Wherever you get your information, make sure it's from a reliable source. Um, Seachoice.org, I haven't been on that website in a while, but um, I'll spell it out, S-E-A, and then choice. So seachoice.org, this is an organized, uh, our website that was put together by several um, not-for-profit organizations. The David Suzuki Foundation is one of them. So I trust David Suzuki, <laughs> and hopefully you do too. But um, the reason why I mention that is because it does talk about, they do talk about um, selected varieties in terms of contamination level from heavy uh, metals, as well as sustainable sources. So people, I hope people are interested in that as well. And so I think that can serve as a good guide. Um, and then, you know, there also have been some problems with 
labeling in the grocery store. So we're not entirely sure if what we're getting is, or what's labeled is what we're getting. Um, but all we can do is the best that we can do. And how do you prepare it? Well, I know that Cardiac College has some wonderful videos on, um, that can give you some tips on how to prepare different foods and a lot more information. So I encourage you to go to the website for more information and talk to your wonderful dietitians because they're so knowledgeable and I know that they can and would be happy to support you on this. Um, we can we can finish up there. And so, um, like we said, any of the questions that we weren't able to get to today, we will post answers online over the next couple of days. So stay tuned for that. Um, I would like to thank Maria so much for um, speaking with us today. It was wonderful, um, very informative. Um, and we look forward to the next time you uh, do a presentation for us. So thank you so much. Um, and just for everyone who's called in today, we um, hope you tune in with us next Tuesday for our Women with Heart Online session. Next week's session will be Beyond the Heart, Her Mind Matters. And Dr. Carolina Carvalho will um, be doing that presentation. So we look forward to, um, to that presentation next week. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in today. And we'll see you next week. Have a good day.